Uh, hi, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's uh, session. This is our first keynote session for the Unraveling the Cycling City course. Uh, and today we are happy to have uh, George Liu with us uh, to give a quick keynote talk. Uh, I will be assisted by Facundo uh, along with uh, me here today. I just wanted to give you a brief agenda for the today's session first. Uh, I will be introducing George. Uh, that will be followed by the keynote talk by George himself, uh, which will be about 30 minutes. And after that, uh, there will be a Q&A session uh, for about 25 minutes. Uh, of course, George doesn't need much introduction, but uh, there's a little something that I wanted to let you know about George. Uh, George is a PhD researcher studying on how ideas from urban design can guide the creation of attractive environments that encourages cycling as a practical and desirable mode of transport. He also studies the emerging concepts of cycle highways, uh, which is conceptualized by practitioners, academics, and people cycling in the Northern European countries. George is currently cross-appointed at the Eindhoven University of Technology and the University of Amsterdam as a part of the Smart Cycling Futures project. Uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of a note uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, during the George's uh, talk, uh, you can put your questions on the chat screen, uh, which would be compiled by Facundo, and he will be moderating and queuing the questions, which we will ask on your behalf after the Q&A session is over. So, George, how are you? Hey, I'm doing excellent. Yourself. Very good. And I Very hope good. everyone else is doing excellent too. <laughs> We're all trying to do the best we can. Yeah. Hey, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Uh, and uh, without much ado, further ado, please do start and uh, give us your keynote talk on Beyond Stated Preferences. Excellent. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the, the MOOC team uh, for, you know, you're all volunteers, so it's great to see the initiative to, to have these things happen and to have these talks being organized. Um, we tr try to keep the MOOC fresh, um, but, uh, but the, the course content itself isn't always easily updated without interrupting you know, the progress of current students. So this is, these live sessions are, are, are a great way to add on and to keep things you know, current. Um, I was going to talk about bicycle highways today, but then I realized uh, there's a whole, you know, lecture in there about bicycle highways. So I'm going to talk about uh, my research on cycling experience instead. Um, and the two are not unrelated. Uh, they're actually quite closely related in terms of I try to use bicycle highways as a way to apply the research on cycling experience. Um, so by the end of this talk, you can ask me questions either on the, the paper presented in the course or uh, the presentation that I'm putting forward today. So uh, today I'll be presenting some findings based on a paper uh, that I wrote before the Bicycle Highway paper. I'm putting a, a link to that paper in the chat box below. And uh, it'll be about the cycling experience. And right now I'm taking the idea of cycling experience and trying to figure out how it relates to the current body of research uh, on uh, you know stated preferences and revealed preferences which is kind of like a quite an academic way to talk about uh, what people say versus what people do so uh, stated preferences generally is is a way that we try to find out what people want or or uh, what people desire uh, in a laboratory setting. So uh, to do research using stated preferences, an example would be uh, you're taking a, a few different infrastructure types, you know, protected infrastructure uh, or, or sharers or uh, bike lanes or no infrastructure. Um, so, uh, and using that type of categories to ask people, hey, it, given this road type, what would you prefer? So it's very hypothetical. On the other hand, um, stated preferences, uh, sorry, revealed preferences is generally done using GPS study, right? So now most of those uh, revealed preference study is done by GPS. 
which means you track people on what they do, what kind of routes they choose. For example, if people choose the shortest route, then you can ascertain from that data that people like the shortest route, or if people choose a route with separated bicycle infrastructure at the expense of perhaps longer detours, then we can uh, make the conjecture that people uh, would take prefer uh, protected infrastructure or a separate bike path, even though they have to give up times for it. So in the era of big data and easy access to GPS, right, because all of us has GPS in our phones, um, it's, it, the research had, seems to be heading more that way. Now, what my talk is about is how do we take these two categories and how do we um, move forward and learn more about people's motivation and meaning, right? Because having uh, GPS data from your phone tells us nothing or, or next to nothing about what our motivations are or, or why we choose what we choose. And, you know, Unraveling the Cycling City kind of gets into that, uh, especially, you know, these articles on rule breaking for those uh, of you in week four. Um, and I'd like to uh, look more into the why, you know, why do people choose what they choose? So let's talk about uh, experiments because uh, they're, they're quite ex important, you know, as a, as a scientist, right? What is an experiment? And, and better yet, what's the difference between uh, an observation and an intervention? So um, first of all, the, the experiment involves number one, uh, specific instruments and specific people, right? So usually when we think of an experiment, we think of uh, someone in a lab coat, right? Administering doses of medicine, perhaps in a very controlled environment, which is number two, uh, aims for a controlled inducement of changes in the laboratory. And then number three, uh, measurement of these changes before, during, and after. So this is our traditional concept of what an experiment is. But the problem with uh, bicycle research is that the world isn't very neat like that. And it's kind of hard to put cycling into a laboratory where we can control everything. Therefore, we mostly rely on observations for what we do. So we, we try and observe the, the way that people choose their routes or observe uh, the type of environments that people cycle through and we try and make some conclusions. Um, another way is to ask people what they prefer, right? Um, and this is also not an experiment uh, in, in the true sense because we, we don't have a before and after. We're just trying to obtain data. So it's, it's also a, a, an observation-like uh, type of way of getting data. Now, where does meaning come in and where does the why matter. So I think the, the why matters is because there, right now there's revealed preference and stated preference, right? Um, the why matters because neither of these categories kind of tell us exactly what uh, the reasons for these preferences, right? And I think even the word preference uh, is, a, a, is a bit constraining because uh, we, we want to know not just about preferences, but about uh, the, the reasons behind people's choices. And the reasons may be uh, motivation, right? Uh, why, why, why does cycling matter? And that's also some of the things that we covered in the course. So the, the difference between stated and revealed preferences also seem to matter less. Uh, it seems that GPS has really supplanted um, the, this research. Most revealed preference uh, research can be done using by just tracking people to see where they go. So th there's not many things that are very interesting there, uh, aside from more and more data. And uh, on this stated preference is if you're just asking people, you know, uh, what type of roots do you like? Um, it seems a bit shadow, shallow, given our huge access to GPS data, which tells us exactly what kind of roots people prefer. So what's the alternative to, to this type of research? I think uh, the alternative is to look into uh, research that looks more at 
at motivations specifically, right? Um, some of the research I do is, is you know, ride along research, which is uh, doing interviews on the go and trying to ascertain, you know, a meaning that's more than just transport. Because if we think about you know, cycling as just traffic determinism, right, as just transportation, then uh, we don't see a reason to obtain people's motivations for travel. But if we see uh, transport as uh, cycling as a, a meaningful way of being, right? So, you know, you can observe people standing outside of a cafe and you don't ask, you know, is that an efficient thing to be doing? <laughs> They're not moving anywhere. If you think of uh, many of our stationary activities, we assume that there's meaning behind it, right? If we're at the office, we're working. It's a very clear why if we're at home, we're doing home stuff. But for some reason, when we're on the move, uh, we immediately switch to this uh, scientific mindset. Of like, where's this person trying to go? And that's, the, uh, that's not very helpful uh, for getting motivations. And I think there's, uh, there's a lot more that can be explored here. So uh, with that in mind, I, my research is on cycling experience and that's kind of the, the why for uh, the aspect of the why that I wanna to touch uh, in today. Um, so I'm gonna go briefly to a, a 2018 paper I wrote um, to this diagram, which, which outlines you know, three different ways. Let me just go find that, it was up here briefly, here it is. Um, so, which outlines three different you know, types of cycling experiences, you know, social, uh, sensory, and, and spatial, right? And this kind of gives you uh, an inside out view of what, uh, what matters for people that, that, that ride a bike. So on, on the social side, you know, we tend to forget that interaction is important, that uh, you know, the sense of normality that the social context is, is important for people who bike. Um, for example, if you're in a context where no one cycles and it's kind of weird, then obviously that's going to affect, you know, the way that, uh, that you travel as well. Uh, sensory, you know, the, the way that we feel on a bike, uh, it's a very sensory way of moving. It's very different from automobile traffic. Uh, if you're in a box, right, uh, shielded from the environment, which inter interestingly, if, uh, if you're in a car, it's actually much easier to do these laboratory experiments because you can simulate, you know, the windshield, you can simulate the, the visual effects of being in a car. It's a, it's a lot like a video game, but uh, it's very much more difficult to simulate uh, the feeling of being on a bike, right? Uh, it's not a chair. You kind of have to balance, uh, you feel the pavement. So it's, it's very difficult to do laboratory experiments for cycling versus a car where you can like, simulate you know, what's coming up on the windshield. You can get people to play driving games, for example, um, and, and you can do experiments that way. So that's, that's kind of the reason also why it's so little is understood about cycling. Um, and then spatial, right? How do people create a sense of the environment? Uh, how do people make sense or develop preferences for, for certain uh, environments around them because cycling is more about than just environment. Uh, sorry, it's more than just infrastructure. Um, what kind, why do prefer, people prefer greenery? Why do people prefer certain types of architecture? Um, and maybe these are the kind of questions that we'll never know in the particular, but we do know in general, you know, what kind of environments people uh, prefer when riding a bike and they seem to be uh, approximately the same types of environments as people prefer uh, walking. And, and that's why it's important, I think, to look at urban design. It's because we have a history of knowledge, though not entirely scientific. We do have a history of, uh, of knowledge uh, from architects and as people who have made cities, you know, uh, according to certain design principles that uh, have been de developed through the year. And it's uh, it'll be interesting to make that body of knowledge much more scientific, do experiments on it, uh, do more observation uh, to obtain why and how, what type of environments uh, people prefer exactly. Um, 
so let's, uh, I, I want to just go through a, a few quotes here that some of the, you in the course might find interesting because uh, this paper wasn't in the course. Um, you know, uh, here, so, um, so what were the things that you notice on a bike, right? Uh, not McCarthy 2011 finds that not only do cyclists list of hosts of risks attributed to this driver behavior and attitudes, but they have also formed through the process of sense making a common framework that explains the origins of risks posed by drivers. Right. So that's a, a piece of research on cycling, uh, on cycling experience um, that was done using uh, interview and direct uh, transcriptions, right? Um, which is very different from the type of research that we typically do, which is based on uh, data and, and surveys. So this, this is an example of the, the sense making that we need to do as researchers. Um, that uh, cycling is not just about going from A to B, but it's also about kind of figuring out what kind of questions are, are valuable to be asking. And uh, especially when it comes to risk, especially when it comes to danger, you know, these fields of research have much more in common with uh, researchers who study pedestrian environments than they do with people who are in the safety of an automobile. Uh, let's go to an example of a sensory experience, right? Um, so uh, let's go to this one about shoes, which I think again illustrates the uh, the, the the similarities between you know uh, cycling and walking. Shoes, I quote, can be understood as part of a hybrid unit of analysis, right? Um, human socks, shoes, pavement. We rarely do we break it down that, that far. Where shoes intervene and disrupt the flow between the body and the pavement. You know, and, and that we can think of uh, that in a similar way to, to cycling where the, the type of equipment you use uh, disrupts or intervenes with the way that you actually experience the city. And I'd say that's, that's also something that we could look forward to uh, researching more is you know, in some contexts, uh, the, the traditional Dutch bicycle, right, uh, is, is, is almost universal. Uh, in other contexts, such as North America, it's much more mountain bikes. So what does a machine have to do with the human? How does that interaction happen? Um, and what kind of implications are there for, uh, for cycling? Um, now, perhaps, to close off this talk, I want to also talk a bit about uh, e-bikes, right? So uh, e-bikes are kind of taken over the market. Uh, they're more than, in the Netherlands, it's more than 50% of all sales, I believe. So it's, uh, it, they're more expensive. So maybe not uh, the number of bikes, but definitely the, the sales, the value of bikes, more than 50% of new bikes being sold are e-bikes. And, uh, and I suspect it's it's been way past that mark in places uh, like China already, where uh, these much cheaper e-bikes are are on the market for quite some time. And I think e-bikes are are an interesting case where we focus on a lot of the transportation aspects of it, right? Uh, how it goes faster, enables people to ped pedal further, um, but there's there's something underlying that, and that is, I think e-bikes change the way that uh, cycling is experienced, right? It becomes much more of a motorized vehicle. And, um, and to the extent to which e-bikes and norm bikes share characteristics and defer, and um, that would be a very interesting avenue of research. And also, you know, if, if you're able to throttle it completely or if you need to pedal assist, there, there are questions about how people get around, but there are also questions about uh, the, the meaning and the experience of cycling that changes as a result of uh, putting a motor on a bicycle. So let's uh, go back to the original question, um, you know, which we started with was you know, these research with large sample sizes may reliably capture preferences, but what about motivation, right? Um, and I, I think 
that's a place that we can improve on, understand more of the why, and only by understanding more of the why can we then uh, in the future, you know, uh, understand exactly uh, what is what research needs to be uh, conducted, um, and also the the blind spots that we have on cycling research. So that's my that's my two cents uh, in this talk, and that is uh, also why I think you know we need to go beyond stated preferences, and why we we should be exploring motivation and meaning more uh, as we look at uh, how cyclists interact with the world around them. So, hey, thanks for tuning in. Uh, look forward to the questions. Hey, thanks, George. Uh, it was indeed a very informative talk. Uh, we're waiting uh, for the questions to stream in, and uh, I think Facundo will help me out with this. Facundo. Yes, uh, for the moment, uh, we have two questions. So the first one would be, uh, George, how does the sort of spatial data from uh, apps like C.Sense uh, Ride Insights fit in? Okay, um, so I'm just looking at the, the web page here uh, briefly. So uh, I think let's, let's, uh, let's think about the, the, the underlying problem here um, and that is that uh, the perhaps the the responsibility of of safety and and who bears it um, and whether or and and whether you know we should be requiring people um, to have uh, technology in order to be safe right I think that's uh, that's the question here um, so, but this question is also about data, like apps. So um, I'm trying to get to the data page. Let's look at this together, actually. Here, let me, uh, let me put this up. Uh, perhaps uh, we could unmute Kim and Kim could uh, for further inform us about what data she's talking about. Uh, yeah. Here, here's a yes. web page. Uh, I don't know, Kim, if, uh, if you have a particular information about the app. Kim, if you uh, want to, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I was going to ask about, um, it gives a look, there's more to it than just what's there. You can collect data on how people are reacting to the road. So how if they turn sharply or if they experience a lot of vibration and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that can also be brought into people's experience and you can see the hotspots and maybe survey the hotspots or something like that. I, I, it's, it's all rather new, so I don't know how you'd use that. Okay, so the, uh, good. I, I note here that there's a, there's a qualitative survey de delivered via the app, which I, I find that quite interesting. Is you, you're, we're now able to you know, time quite precisely what the quantitative measurements for, for cycling are and put that together with uh, the qualitative data. So for example, if you experience a, a near miss um, and you're able to give a reaction to that immediately, that would be combining uh, an outside in perspective, which is a, probably accelerometers on, on the device and GPS data, and also matching with that uh, some reaction from the cyclist. Uh, so I, without understanding this more, I think I can talk to that concept, and that is quite useful. It's uh, it's because what has been difficult is trying to measure um, people's reactions while on the move, uh, right? Uh, usually, it's been um, take people out on a bike ride, and then you kind of perform a survey afterwards about you know uh, when you experienced a near miss, how did you feel? But that's by the time that that happens, by the time the researcher gets to the person they're trying to research, 
the incident may have happened, uh, you know, a, a, a few days ago, a week ago, a year ago, um, and the memory clouds uh, what the sense was in the moment. So by being able to sync up um, exactly what the instant was uh, in terms of the accelerometer, so however the near miss or the incident is calculated with um, a feedback by the person who was involved in that instance and be able to have those two data sets together, I think that's, uh, that could be really useful to understanding uh, how people interpret you know, these events in the environment. So thanks for that question. I look forward to following up on this. Um, is this is this a yeah? I I wonder um, if this is this would be good for for data collection for the the research community. And I I think on the consumer side, it's much more uh, targeted at uh, I don't know. These, uh, these lights and, and things. So that's my answer to the question. Uh, I'll look into this product a bit more and see what I see what's there. Thanks. Okay, so we have another question from Anthony. And they're asking, do you have knowledge about preferences depending on the type of bike, for example, a, an e-bike or a cargo bike, and the type of use? For example, going to work, going to the grocery, traveling with your kids, etc. Yes, uh, we just published a paper about uh, cargo bike preferences um, a few a few months ago. Let's see if I can look that up. Um, and and the results. Let's see. It's 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 hard to actually categorize these uh, different types of bicycles. Even uh, that's one comment I'll make uh, while doing research. Even cargo bikes have their their subcategorizations, right? You have three wheeled cargo bikes, which actually feel quite a bit different than two wheeled cargo bikes, um, and then you have these cargo bikes with the the load on the back. You have cargo bikes with the load in the front. Uh, electric cargo bikes feel very different from non electric cargo bikes, just because of the weight, especially if you're in a hilly environment. Um, so just trying to narrow down the selection uh, and the, the choices uh, to make of what type of bikes we're studying and what types of um, bikes we're not studying was, was difficult. And as to the, uh, the motivation, you know, so why people ride, uh, where they're going, is it a leisure ride, is it a utilitarian ride? That was, um, it was also, difficult to determine in conjunction with um, the, the qu quantitative data we we're collecting. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to determine on the one hand, if you're doing a traffic count or, or a GPS study, um, exactly what type of trip it is, uh, right? Like uh, there's some figuring out and puzzle pieces to be done, figuring out, okay, if this person is going from here to here, you know, they're clearly going from home to work. But it's it's not uh, it's not cut and dry in terms of uh, being able to figure that out for you know, thousands of people. And if you're doing a traffic count, it's it's even more difficult. While while you can get the type of bicycle from a traffic count, right? So you're, you're standing there and trying to figure out who's riding what, and you can figure out the gender. It's it's much more difficult to then get the purpose because you're not going to stop everyone to ask them. Whereas with GPS studies, uh, generally, if you're doing research, you're getting a big data set from someone else because they're, um, they're less expensive to conduct now with cell phones, but um, privacy issues are important. So you can't then track down the people who are in the data set to ask them uh, you know, exactly what type of bikes you were riding and to confirm the data, are you going to home or work? So there's quite a bit of methodological issues with connecting uh, all these different elements that we want to know about. Um, and then perhaps more difficult in the same question is what kind of socioeconomic group uh, are they in, et cetera, et cetera. And having a survey that determines that with the GPS data and trying to get uh, to know what type of bike exactly that they're riding. Um, maybe one day we'll be able to get all of that information together and make a useful determination. But uh, for now, I think 
having having that's a challenge and also determining what type of bike to include or exclude uh, what is a cargo bike for example is also a challenge and perhaps something that we won't really ever figure out uh, given the wide variety of bikes out there okay so the next question is from i believe it's pronounced rohit i apologize in advance if the names are different um he uh, they say arafa long reads article stated that using gps for navigation might potentially make our memory weaker. In comparison, cyclists should have a better memory and visual cue and hints on local markets. Um, so this is a question. In comparison, do cyclists, cyclists have a better memory um, and visual cues? And also, will that then help local economies? Wow. Intuitively, I, I have no doubt uh, that's the case. In terms of uh, research, I think that can be backed up by quite a few studies uh, for, for drivers. I, 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 the whole talk was about how cyclists and drivers are different, but I suspect you know if, if people driving cars are interpreting, have better memories of their routes, which is a, a field that research has been done on, then perhaps uh, it's even applied more so to people cycling who have a better sense of their environment. So I, I suspect that's true. The link to economics um, and, sorry, can you repeat the, the last question? I can't find it on the chat here. The, the, just the last part. Yes, of the... um, they were asking if this uh, difference would help uh, the local economies. I don't know how to answer that one. That's uh, that's a that's a, a bit of a stretch to go from memories to local economies, um, but perhaps I, I think there might be an argument to be made that uh, cyclists. Well, we do know that bike lanes you know, promote businesses from a few recent studies, so maybe part of that effect is um, a, a more intimate interaction between uh, people on bike and their local environment. So if, especially if it's Main Street businesses, which was a particular study, uh, then if you're driving at the speed of a car, you know, those types of environments aren't designed for being passed at 60 you know, kilometers an hour. But if you're on a bike, then the, the, the number of buildings is you're going slow enough that you can actually you know, find what you're looking for and the signs are legible, et cetera. Whereas uh, if you're driving really quickly, you're looking more for like a highway rest stop or those giant signs that lure you in you know, while you're going really fast. So I think the speed of mobility, not so much the, the memory of the environment would determine whether you're able to locate what you're finding in that environment um, and also being able to pull over and park your bike. Maybe that's a factor, but this is you know, all personal conjecture on that point. Then we have uh, Yain who says, on choosing routes, avoiding traffic lights is a factor. Has there been good studies to quantify how much energy or time is lost in stop start journeys? Ah, how much energy is lost? Um, I think this is interesting because it's, it's, it's more of a mechanical question, right? This, is, this more speaks to the, uh, the it, uh, the cycling as a, as a human machine, something that we can you know, figure out using, using physics really uh, about power loss and, and how much energy it takes to get started and stopped versus uh, the, the wind resistance but going at full speed. But I, I don't think that's the, the really relevant factor here because we, we do know that it takes a, quite a bit of energy to get uh, something that's stopped into motion. Uh, I think this question, though, what's more relevant is how people uh, interpret, you know, this um, this energy being put in, right? Um, how do people experience it, and whether they're adverse to it, or whether they uh, they appreciate, you know, this uh, input of energy? Um, perhaps there's a distinction there to be made between uh, people who are out for a recreation ride and people who are out for uh, a ride to work. Um, maybe more importantly, maybe in the future, this, this distinction will become less relevant 
uh, as more people ride e-bikes. Uh, because one of uh, what I do know with uh, e-bike riders is that um, when I was doing my personal research that they uh, mention quite frequently the eradication of wind. So it takes the unpredictability out of the route. Uh, that if you have a lot of headwind, for example, it affects how long it takes to get to your destination. Um, so, you know, when speaking to some Dutch people, uh, as they were growing up, getting to school, the largest variable was not the traffic light, but actually the amount of headwind they get. You know, if you're going uh, 10 kilometers on the countryside, flat environment. Um, and one of them mentioned that with an e-bike, you would completely eradicate that variable, making your journeys more predictable. Um, and therefore, you know, making uh, cycling more of a, a better transportation alternative and you're not exhausted by the time you arrive at work. So perhaps the question to the traffic light, the answer to the traffic light question is uh, to what extent does it make you exhausted and tired by the time you get to work? Um, maybe that's the biggest variable. Um, and maybe in the future, this variable will become less important um, if more people are on e-bikes and the waiting time at traffic lights, maybe that becomes a much more important variable. I'm also going to put, yeah. yeah, sorry, I'm going to post the cargo bike paper in the chat here. Uh, maybe we'll add that to the course at some point, but uh, that's for you to read. Oh, sorry, to a public group. Yeah, go ahead, next question. Yeah, the next question is from Sean. And the question is, do you have any suggestions on how cities with lower bike commute rates can normalize bicycling and also reinforce that bike, the biking is generally safe? And also, what about cities that face potentially dangerous weather, for example, uh, heat that's over 115 degrees Fahrenheit for a specific period of time, but are otherwise topographically ideal for biking? Hmm. Now, uh, the weather one's tough. Um, the, the weather one, may, maybe there's, there's there are just places that uh, are too extreme for cycling. Uh, for for example, if we if we take a you know, example from the streetscape from pedestrians, um, you know, there's cities being built on deserts, and uh, in these places, these climates, most of the architecture uh, is built in a way that everyone is uh, in an air conditioned environment. For example, right? So uh, either above ground walkways or uh, underground walkways, um, and apart from that, mostly just automotive travel, right? So uh, I'm thinking of these places like Dubai, Houston, uh, etc. So that was, I think that's uh, the architectural solution on the pedestrian side. Um, is there a similar way to protect people from the elements uh, on the cycling side? Um, it, it, there doesn't seem to be a, a good way to do that, you know, because if you get too, too much enclosure, it's a lot more weight. At what point is it no longer a bicycle? Um, and then if, uh, if you're trying to get people inside, then space, spatial efficiency becomes much more of an issue. Um, so then you get into, you know, walkways, uh, escalators, et cetera, in which case do you really, does everyone really need a bike in that environment? So that's a, that's a tough one. Maybe there are environments where um, cycling won't be uh, as as popular uh, due to you know the the temperature variations or weather. Uh, and interesting about hills is I go back to the e-bike is that maybe that's a solution that can be solved by technology, right? Uh, hilly hilly environments um, may become much less of an issue compared to places that are hot, too hot, or too cold. Um, and that perhaps in the long term will be a much more difficult issue. Um, so can you say again the first part of the question? Yes, um, they asked, do you have any suggestions on how cities with lower bike commute rates can normalize bicycling and also reinforce that biking is generally safe? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one, I think. Um, how do you make a normal 
it, it's a vicious cycle. I don't think we really have figured it out yet. You know, it's uh, more people makes the activity more normal. Um, there are perhaps w one area of very lots of contention. There might be even a lot of contention in this room is, is helmet loss, right? Um, not wearing a helmet does make the activity more convenient. Um, so maybe there's, there's something to be said. Uh, if you look at Denmark, you know, Copenhagen, where there's more people wearing helmets compared to the Netherlands where almost, you know, no one wears a helmet. Maybe there's a, uh, there's a study that can be done to kind of figure out uh, the impact of helmet use on the, the normality of cycling. But then again, there's also cultures where you know, the helmet is the normal thing to do, still with uh, some degree uh, of, uh, of cycling. So maybe that's a key issue. Uh, I don't have a good answer. I don't think really anyone has a good answer for that. It's a tough question that we'll, we'll keep working at. Um, you talked a bit ago about e-bikes and the next, next question is about e-bikes. So Cyril asks, what are your thoughts on where e-bikes belong within urban mobility spaces? Um, how governance should impose or suggest policies and what impact may be in terms of equity? For example, decreasing the desire of some groups to cycle while e-bikes allow others. Perhaps more privileged groups to cycle uh, for again, some different purposes, leisure, versus utility hmm. e-bikes are interesting uh th there's a few issues there there's the, the equity issue like what what does it mean to for everyone to spend a thousand dollars to to be included in this activity um maybe the economic issue will be solved in the future i think uh, what's more interesting for me in that question is the the safety issue um i think i was reading somewhere while I was doing you know, automotive safety research, that the safest car is a, a car with a spike point directly at the driver, right? The, the safest car is the car that is most dangerous for the occupant. So uh, if we kind of think about that logic, uh, that perhaps the, the safest e-bike is the e-bike that's most dangerous for the rider, right? Um, so what does that mean? That means that um, as e-bikes become heavier, uh, there's a certainly looks like there's e-bikes on that very he heavy side of the spectrum, e-bikes that look more like mopeds, right? They become safer for the rider. The more mass there is in the vehicle, the more uh, force that vehicle is gonna take on impact versus uh, a, a vehicle with, or a person that's much lighter. Right. That, that makes sense. So basic physics. So the heavier we make e-bikes, uh, the more dangerous, I believe, people are going to be inclined to, to act. I think it's, it's common. It's, I mean, it's not common sense, but that's just uh, the way that uh, risk would be distributed. If, if you're completely rational and you're cared about your own safety, the heavier the bike, uh, the more aggressively perhaps you would be riding it. Um, so perhaps one solution uh, that's not overly onerous or complicated on the legal side um, is to, to make sure that e-bikes are below a certain weight, that they are not excessively ha heavy. Um, in terms of the top speed, you know, there's a lot of talks about making sure people don't go too fast. Perhaps it's informative to look at um, racing cyclists, right? Uh, people can go really fast under their own power. You know, if you have a professional cyclist out for a sport ride, they're going you know, 40, 50 kilometers an hour on a flat ground. So um, we know that people going this fast are using the infrastructure. Um, so it's, it's not so easy to say if we limit the top speed of e-bikes, then we limit all fast cyclists, right? Um, so I'd say that the weight more than the top speed uh, would be more important. And um, obviously there needs to be some limit to the top speed, but uh, going too fast isn't necessarily the danger. The danger is uh, people making the choice to go too fast, right? Making it artificially feel too safe uh, for people to be 
going too fast on especially like pedestrian environments or dense urban environments where that kind of speed is completely uncalled for. And, and I think at some point we have to rely on people's common sense. If an environment is clearly you know, designed with a lot of cross traffic and a lot of people sharing the space, um, that's where social norms kick in more than we can regulate top speed. Um, and you know what, top speed, sometimes that's one of the advantages of e-bikes, right? If you're out in the countryside and there's wide open path, maybe going you know, relatively faster than you would in an urban space is, uh, is a completely rational thing to do. So uh, that's, my, that's my two cents. Weight over weight limits over speed limits, if I had a choice. Okay. Um, Sarah from the UK says, that cycling infrastructure is really patchy and means you're cycling with cars, etc., which feels unsafe and a bit hostile. Whilst GPS data shows where people cycle at the moment, it doesn't show where there's unmet need. For example, for data protected cycle routes, um, is there a potential to capture or survey the unmet potential? Hmm. Yeah, this is where. Um this is where the, the models come in, right? When we try and predict uh, future bicycle traffic. Um, and actually the, the reason behind uh, stated and revealed preferences, kind of like why they exist, um, in, in a sense is to calibrate these models, right? We take these revealed preferences. So you know, we track people via GPS and we have a pretty good sense of what kind of routes after they're built, you know, what kind of routes they prefer. Um, and if we're lucky, we have some natural experiments where a, a new route does get built and we see how many people shift over to the new route, right? And using that shift, we can, we can determine, you know, the, the propensity of people to use that particular route. And then we can take a look at that new route to see if it's high quality, low quality, et cetera. Uh, and we kind of make a model out of it using all that data. Um, and, the input for that model could also be stated preferences. So, you know, we also have research on which people prefer separated bike paths. You know, uh, when is it appropriate to, to merge traffic, take all that data into a, a model and traffic engineers and is using these models, you know, urban planners to try and predict where um, a new site segment of bicycle route could belong. Right. Uh, that's kind of the conventional way of, of thinking about it. But the, the problem is the models that we have currently, uh, and especially when I was doing research in bicycle highways, it turns out that they're completely useless. So <laughs> these models are being used to justify um, funding uh, for one or, or a rationale for building new bike infrastructure, but they're, they're really not any, they're no good at the moment. Um, and the numbers that they predict are quite far away from the numbers that actually uh, are realized, right? So that means there's, a, despite all the GPS data that we have, despite all the calibrations and the input that we're modeling these bike paths with, um, it's saying that there's something that we can't account for quantitatively. There's something in there that's, that's uh, that even though it works for most car traffic models, you know, this typical gravity model or, um, or agent based modeling, even these, though these techniques work for automotive traffic, it seems that there's something about cycling in which these models don't work. And that's kind of the, the residual left over from uh, the correct predictions versus what, you know, how much is unaccounted for. And maybe, and if, if, if my hunch is correct and there's so many micro elements and context dependent elements to cycling uh, and things are unmeasurable, such as, uh, you know, uh, the type of building environment, the, 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 vol the micro volumes of traffic day by day, maybe um, these models will never be a uh, hundred percent correct. And they might continue to be quite a uh, far off just because it's difficult to predict how people respond to their immediate microenvironment versus how they respond on a network traffic scale. 
Okay, so next we got, we have a question from Chris and it says, how do you see this information being used in a practical sense? It's fine for most of us uh, as consumers, for example, bike riders, to consider, to consider this, but how can we use this information to get our city engineers and administrators to provide what we need to feel uh, safer and better about riding? So that on the one hand, and then uh, they go on and ask uh, more relevant perhaps, how can this be used to make cycling more accepted generally as a transport mode? So uh, it's, let's, let's talk about the, the city administration. It asks about how do we get this accepted, the political system and the system that runs uh, transportation and traffic, right? the, the, the people that we must influence to change the environment. And the reason I talked extensively just before about modeling is that um, the, the, tr the people that control roads and public space in general around the world, it's actually quite surprising that that's the case almost everywhere, are increasingly you know, traffic engineers. And there's a certain, or, or and urban planners who you know, are justifying their decisions using quantitative modes. So um, actually the, the research that I'm doing into these experiences um, don't translate well into models, right? Um, and the challenge there is to figure out whether there is a, an independent or competing logic that uh, our administrators would accept to justify a decision, right? Uh, just because the, the models are wrong doesn't mean that the particular infrastructure is not worth being built. Um, there are people who, practitioners who build bicycle infrastructures who, who know that the model is wrong. Um, and given the model is wrong, they still have to make these decisions, right? Um, and increasingly, I think these decisions uh, should be, maybe the engineering way of looking at these decisions is, is it can be replaced by a completely different you know, paradigm, right? That, that if we don't think of traffic flow and carrying people as the primary objective of building bicycle infrastructure, right? Maybe it's a, it's a neighborhood beautification project. Um, some people have argued that bicycle infrastructure is a traffic calming project. Uh, it could be parks. It could be uh, a, turned into a linear park, for example, uh, enhancement of public space. These are all projects are, and logics are not related to carrying traffic. So perhaps one way to bring this research into some kind of practical use is to say that we're thinking about the problem the wrong way, the, that the primary purpose of bicycle infrastructure is indeed not as infrastructure at all. The people that, the fact that people use this environment or, or the bike path as a side effect, but the primary um, purpose perhaps of some bike paths uh, is to create a, a better and more appealing you know, public space. And that's, that's kind of as far as I've gotten on the other side of the logic, because the alternative would be try to incorporate this into you know, traffic modeling. And, uh, and, it's, and so far, it's, uh, efforts have been really unsuccessful. And perhaps, as I said, the reason it's un unsuccessful is because it's not capable of being incorporated into a traffic model. Okay, so we're at the one hour mark. Um, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure, let's do one more. Okay, um, so the question is, has there been any work done on accidents uh, on e-bikes compared to normal bikes? Okay, uh, yes, plenty actually. Plenty of research have been done on e-bikes, accident rates versus normal bikes. I don't know the studies personally, but I, I do know that that's, uh, that's, that's a huge field of study. Um, and perhaps the related question there is, are, are e-bikes more dangerous? And, uh, and maybe that's, that's something that research, the numbers can tell us. 
uh, perhaps what's what's interesting for me uh, on top of the are e-bikes more dangerous question is um, is how they enable how the behavior of people on e-bikes can be interpreted by others right so how do we solve that problem of danger um, rather than just heavy regulation for example uh, one of the one of the ways that uh, i think from personal experience you know one of the ways the, the visual cues of a cyclist stopping or, or going really fast is how how fast their their feet are moving right and and if, if you're looking at the cyclist you can tell that they're riding an e-bike because their, their legs aren't quite moving at the same rate as you know as a speed that they're going like it, their body motions don't quite make sense given uh, the way that you know how fast they're traveling um, and perhaps one of the areas of research that we can do better is to determine what kind of visual cues both drivers and cyclists use to, to kind of estimate speed um, and then improving the design of e-bikes to make sure that our visual cues of estimating speed match up with uh, what people expect. Um, and further on that, maybe as more e-bikes are out on the road, perhaps we get better at interacting with e-bikes and maybe that'll lead to a safety gain or maybe not. Maybe e-bikes like motorcycles are just uh, inherently dangerous. We do know that motorcycles are uh, about a hundred times more dangerous than driving, right? So, uh, and so far no one has been able to do anything about it. It's just the inherent design of the vehicle. Maybe it's true that e-bikes are just more inherently more dangerous, um, in which case uh, it becomes a very tough question for policymakers and people who are thinking about inclusivity and you know, these cities have hills, uh, at what kind of trade-off are we willing to make, right, between e-bikes and accessibility, if there is one. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that is it from me. I'll hand the mic back to Sunay. Hey, thank you very much for joining us today. And George, thank you very much. That was indeed a very informative session. I can get a last word in. Uh, sure. you know, I've given some perhaps controversial answers here, so it's good. I think we should be on the edge of controversy for anything to be, you know, uh, to be useful, I guess. It's, I'm trying to take us to the edge of that controversy. So, um, you know, let me know your thoughts if, you, if I said anything factually incorrect or if you have any perspectives on things. Yes, so, Senate, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, sure. I actually wanted to ask you that if people want to follow up and ask you questions, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Uh, uh, is it over Twitter or should they send us your questions and we can forward them to you? I think the, the best way to get in touch would be, yeah, I, I've been trying to stay off uh, social media, but if you if you message me on LinkedIn, I'll, uh, I'll leave the LinkedIn um, at Urban Cycling Institute or LinkedIn, if you just find me uh, at George Liu, um, that's the place I'm at most. And if you want to get in touch with Marco de Promestrut, who's also in the course, he's much more on the Twitter side as well. All right. Thanks, George. Uh, again, uh, thanks everyone for joining in. And I hope uh, this was an informative session for you. Uh, and of course, we look forward to having you for the next session uh, two weeks from now uh, with Trey Han. And uh, please let us know your feedback uh, on how you found the session and how we could make them more informative for you. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to also introduce the rest of the team who's been working behind the scenes to make these sessions possible. Uh, so uh, two new mentors have joined us for this cohort. That's uh, Yasmin and Anna. And besides that, it's uh, me, Sunay, Artem, and Facundo, uh, who have really been putting a lot of their personal time to make these sessions possible. Uh, and uh, we would look forward to organizing more sessions for you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>